as soon as you look at that and you say, this is the reality of now, guess what? That now is already in the past and we're in a new now. So you don't have to carry that vibration into the next moment. Every single thought, action, word that we speak, everything we do in a moment is the precursor to what we're manifesting. I can't say that enough. Every thought we indulge, every action we take, every word we speak is the precursor for what we're manifesting in our future, what we're manifesting. This is the vibration we're taking into the future. So if you're stuck in the, oh, well, this is the reality of now. Well, guess what? You're taking the reality of now and you're bringing it into the reality of now, into the reality of now, into the reality of now. When you have an opportunity every moment to shift that energetic vibration and go into what you truly desire and dream of, which is so big and powerful and amazing that if you have seeds of fear, which most of us do as humans, it's fertile ground for that fear to come up, fertile ground for self-sabotage. Welcome back everyone to the June edition of Ask the YTs. This is episode Fiverr Niner. 59, and I'm here with the beach. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I am here and completely, fully present. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And I wh- showed up. Yeah, why are you practicing presence? I guess we just jumped oh, right into so that. Oh, there's so many things. So many reasons. So many reasons, but I'm just here now, very focused and available. Yeah, well, that's good because we have a lot to talk about today. We've got questions coming in. I hope we can get to everything. Uh, but the first thing that uh, we've been requested to speak about is the blood work that we just received through Inside Tracker. And I am happy to say that my results are stellar. Like they couldn't be they couldn't be better. I'm pretty much optimized in everything. So all the big concerns of being on a plant-based diet as an athlete, iron, calcium, vitamin D, vitamin B12, and protein, all in the optimized zones. And then everything else is normal. So it goes into cholesterol levels, it goes into um, testosterone, cortisol, all of that stuff is totally normal. So I'm excited to say that uh, everything is tip top in this 45 year old body. And then what I think is really, really cool about the results that we got in Beach, you and I just went through like line for line and we're really close on everything, but there's one area where you're pretty deficient. And and what I'm pulling from this is just another confirmation, you guys, that nutrition is so individual and it's really, really important to find the diet that works for you. The diet as in your daily nutrition, not the diet as in some fad thing that you do for 30 days. Yeah, your lifestyle. A lifestyle. Yeah. Your lifestyle. Like, so I want to, I just want to explain to people that don't know what Inside Tracker is because we just went right into this, but Inside Tracker is a service, online service that you can subscribe to that will allow you to go get your blood work and it, within three to four days afterwards, you get a report on your profile and inside tracker and it gives you the result of all your blood work depending on which package you selected. So it'll tell you your testosterone, your iron level, your magnesium, all of these factors, but it goes a step further and it goes into why it'll give a video of why it could be low or why it could be high, why it's not optimized basically. What are the foods that you can eat that are high in these uh, nutrients that can help get you to that optimized zone? And they have a whole list of resources for you to to dive into. So that's the service that we became aware of a few years ago. Uh, We've been following Jonathan Levitt, who is in Boston, and he's been uh, helping us out over the years. We've just been communicating, and we finally just signed up for it. But I hope that gives you an idea of what the service is. Jess and I have been waiting to do this, and we just finally did. So these are the results. Yeah, it's it's really <clears throat> awesome. Like you can sort by different categories. There's all these different views that you can see. So whatever kind of learner you are, however you absorbed information, you're going to get it through all these different different ways. They give you the science behind it. They give you the recommendations, like BJ said, the little videos. And several of our guests, Maggie Rush. Michael Wardian, Wardian, 
Kev Portman, who we just had on the podcast, which will be airing actually next Monday. He's a professional triathlete here in Southern California. He's used it, right? Didn't he use it? He's been using it for years, yeah. actually. Yeah. And I think the reason why we hadn't used it up until now is that a year after we went completely vegan, we did really extensive blood work back in Rhode Island. This is before we knew about Inside Tracker. So we kind of had our baseline and we did one year totally plant-based with no supplementation. And during that year, I completed an Ironman and BJ completed several different distances of, of races. And so we had like our baseline. And back then I was a little bit low on protein. You were low on iron. You were low on iron back then, my friend. And... Now to see, there was a couple other things, like I think I was actually a little low on calcium, nothing really bad, just a little bit lower. And I think that that was really showing my body finding its way back to health after losing the dairy, which was really my last piece from going being vegetarian for most of my life on and off and then being a total cheese addict, finally getting rid of that dairy and I think that was my, my body really achieving its, its health again. And at 45 years old, to see this kind of blood work and the only supplementation that we take, which we just started a couple months ago, is of B12 spray, which my B12 couldn't be more perfectly in the optimized zone. So I'm like wondering if I even need to take it, but I'll keep taking it. But everything else is right on. So let's talk about you, Bijoua. Yeah, so I was most I was on for most things. The the one that the one item that's blaring is iron again. So we got the blood work like just said uh, a few years ago. I have the same issue. So I have uh, low iron. Now, looking at my diet and what I take in every day, I'm pretty sure I'm getting in the iron that I need based on the foods that they recommend, based on the lifestyle I have. However, what is the issue is the absorption. Yeah, because you iron. and I, this is what I love. You and I are literally eating the same diet. I'm preparing right. food for myself, which I prepare for you as well. There's not a lot of differences. I tend to like a bigger breakfast than you do. You might eat a few more tortilla chips than I do. I think the biggest thing is the caffeine, which you can talk about your, how you're changing that. I think caffeine is kind yeah, of an, ca you can read all the studies you want about supporting your bad habits, but caffeine is a, is a drug and it, it really is. It, it affects so many things in your body. And, uh, I detoxed from it about five years ago in, uh, during a three day cleanse. And I just never, ever wanted to put anything in my body that I had to detox from ever again. And so, but anyway, to, to get back, I mean, we pretty much eat the exact same things. And so to see such a difference in our iron, it's not like my iron's low. Like I am smack dab right in the middle of my optimized zone. And mine is low, like really low. Yeah, like low. Yeah. Like is it in the red? It is. I can't believe you're doing what you're doing with such low iron. Yeah. It's but senior. that is a testament to how amazing the human body is. And of course, your activity level is... I was just going to say Your that. activity level is way higher than mine. Even training Ironman, your activity level is way higher than mine. Because our goals are so different. You know, you're literally like training like an Olympic athlete. Like you have to train like that in order to reach the goals that you want to reach. But you're not an Olympic athlete because you're working and you're building a business and you're coaching athletes and you're following your passion and doing all that stuff. So you have a lot on your plate. Yeah. So it's extremely low, really low. And I would say risk. one thing that you're really good at is you're really good at sacrificing sleep. And I am not good at that. Like I will not sacrifice my sleep. I will skip a workout in a heartbeat over sleep. So maybe a little bit of extra sleep. What does it say for... Well, the funny thing is, is all the recommendations, basically. It's like all the recommendations. What you're already doing. <laughs> right. So we got to figure out how to get you to absorb the iron better. Right. And I think the, the blaring one is the caffeine because it just does... It just blocks yourself from absorbing the full impact of the iron that you're consuming. So what are you doing with the caffeine? So with caffeine, starting as of Sunday, last Sunday, I st well, we got these results... I started to wean myself off of the 
crazy caffeine I was taking in quite a lot. But you have a don't you have a partner in crime with this? I do. Running on Venti. One of Go our figure. athletes who is also running on Venti. I mean, do we need to say more? Exactly. But she is also, I hope she doesn't mind, a saying a little iron deficient. Right. She's working on that as well. So we're in this together. So by Sunday, so tomorrow, we're recording this podcast on Saturday. We will be only consuming decaf coffee. So we've gone we from... We welcome you in, my friends. <laughs> we welcome you into the decaf world. <laughs> we've gone from our coffee addiction, which is really what it is. Let's talk about how much coffee you were drinking. Because I don't even think I know how much. I don't know. It just it depends on the day. You know, I've got that little mocha e- espresso pot on the, on the stove now. And I'll probably make two of those a day. Just little espresso shots. Right. But they're little for a reason. They're little. They're powerful. Right. right. And then maybe a cup of coffee. And then occasionally late in the day before a workout, I may have another espresso. So, you know, three, I'd say two to three cups of coffee a day. So now I'm, I, this whole week, I've gone from that to just one cup of coffee a day. And that one cup is half calf. And then just two days ago, I just started decaf. And I've had no That's headaches, awesome. which I which I have had in the past. You've yeah, because you detoxed with me. with me that first time right. years ago. Yeah, and you had I remember you having a pretty rough detox. Yeah. So that's cool. Maybe that's a testament to how healthy the rest of you is. Exactly. You know. Yeah. So how it, are you feeling about it? Like, because it is a bit of an addiction. It's totally an addiction, and it's the, it's that, morning ritual. It's. I went out for a bike ride today and I went by the coffee shops and there's people just in their flip-flops and board shorts and messy hair and sunglasses and they have like this big cup of coffee and it's like 6 or 7.30 in the morning and it's a little bit chilly so they have like a puffy or a, sw- a sweatshirt on and that to me, I just painted the picture of what a morning <laughs> looks like that's pure joy. <laughs> like, drinking your coffee, just hanging out and and... It, there was a brief moment I was like, oh, I want to do that. But then I think what happens when you become very mindful and conscious and aware is that you look for the higher purpose. So the higher purpose of not consuming coffee is for my health. I want to absorb iron. I want to get my iron levels up. I don't want to be deficient and low and at risk in this area. I want to get my body optimized because I want to perform the, my best. And that and I that's how I do my training. Like, I constantly t- learn things from successes and failures in my training, and it's all morphing to be a way to make me the best I can be at the sport in the training realm. Why can't I do that with nutrition? Why can't I do that with sleep? You know, just it's just transferring that focus into the other things. So when I think you are doing that, and this is why it's so important, um, it, you know, in in the cookbook that we're coming out with. Uh, next month is next month August. It's soon enough. August. No, two months. Let's put it off. Soon, soon enough. August is coming, but it's more than a cookbook. So I've got some chapters in it that I've written, like uh, maybe like four chapters. So it's it's not a heavy read. It's an easy read. But in one of the things in the sections about how to thrive, I say one of the, one of the ways of thriving on this diet is like you remove the doubt remove the doubt. So I think you are, BJ, I think you are aligning yourself with, with health, right? But you remove the doubt. Like if there was any doubt or any question, you just removed it by seeing the, your insides and what it is. And yeah, you're iron deficient. Okay. Well then to stay with this commitment to be as healthy as you possibly can, look at what you're taking in, which may be compromising that. Okay. Caffeine. And then you made a choice to remove that. So I think we had the plan of like getting you off the caffeine you're also going to be taking an iron supplement, Floridex. Floridex? Floridex, yep. That we, you had been uh, recommended to take this a while ago. And you're going to take that, which helps with the absorption of iron because there's plenty of iron in our diet. We just got to get your unique, perfect body to absorb it and then test you again in about six months mm-hmm. and see what that looks like. Yeah, and we're taking in a lot of non-heme iron, which is because we don't eat meat and that meat has heme iron. We use non-heme iron in plants. And the better way to have that absorb in your body is to combine that with vitamin C. So it's just being conscious of uh, eating more varied 
fruit. Yeah, tropical fruits. So oranges. And, and I definitely eat more varied fruits you than do. you do. Absolutely. You know, I'm I'm But you eat a lot of bananas. Bananas and blueberries religiously. But I mean, you've come a long way cuz when I met you, you were eating total cereal with a glass of milk next to it. You wouldn't combine them. And tuna straight out of the can, but you didn't like fish. So that was always interesting to me. That was so weird. And then you would do just full on white floured pasta. With white parm flaky pasteurized cheese. White trash parm cheese on top. (laughs) Is there, am I missing anything? No. Maybe turkey sandwiches? Turkey sandwiches, yeah. So you've come a long way. But yeah. it's funny because you can still see those seeds of being like, I, I, I like bananas, so I'm just going to eat bananas. But it's, that, it's looking at that full spectrum and keeping all channels open, right? This, Absolutely. This constant reminder that, that you and I can keep... Eat the same diet, that pretty we, much. Yeah, but we can also keep more channels open and that we can that we have to be willing to look at the truth of what's happening and then and and not be ashamed of that or feel like oh my god I can't be iron deficient because I'm you know we run the yogi triathlete podcast and we you know we're all about plant based nutrition it's it's not that it doesn't mean that if you meditate or you eat a plant based diet that you're never going to get a cold or that you we'll are never going to be yeah low on something right. that you need so the journey doesn't end so that's the whole warrior path thing like this this iron deficiency is just one th- one more thing so now i'm going to address the iron deficiency and work on that that doesn't mean like you're saying at the end i'm going to be like perfectly iron and then my life is all great again like body's perfect and i just gotta get this <laughs> i just one, gotta get this one thing this one thing that is absolutely not what's gonna happen it's just you're on this warrior path you are committed to continuing to improve yourself and, and then, whatever that looks like right now it's the iron great dive in get it done yeah but here's the, and then here's the tough love piece of it like you knew about this six years ago Right? So here it is. We don't deal with the stuff we have to deal with. It doesn't go away. You can forget about it and be like, oh, I feel a little tired or whatever, and just think that that's the way it is. But then you remove the doubt, you get the truth back, and you say, wow, I didn't deal with that before. And guess what? It's still here. So now you have this awesome opportunity to deal with it. And so back to Liz and I, we're both in this together. So as of Sunday, we're just going to be. She'll be running on venti decaf. And <laughs> and like that's amazing that she's gonna take on that. Like this is she's created a whole persona around her coffee drinking. But that's the great thing. Like And it, I love her so much that she's so willing and open. She's right. she's just amazing. That mm-hmm. like, she is an amazing woman, super powerful and strong, so much wisdom and insight. She is absolutely a teacher for so many people. She's so on the path. She's got her tribe going on. And that's the thing that we're seeing with you guys. You you, you know, we're getting feedback from you of of what you're learning, of what you're taking away, you know, guests that speak to you. And then, but what's happening is we see like you guys have your, your own tribes, right? So it's almost like this pyramid scheme that's not a pyramid scheme, right? Like you guys are creating and affecting your own tribes. Like, do you understand the impact that you are all having on the world? It is unbelievable. And this is how we are moving to this collective movement of creating a better world. Right? We just have to keep living our truth. Be totally transparent. Don't ever think you need to hide anything. And, and always be seeking ways to become more of yourself. More of yourself in health. More of yourself in passion. More of yourself in love. Compassion. Athleticism you know, mastering the art of cooking, like whatever it is, become more of yourself in those things that call to you. And the obstacles that come up are there, not by happenstance. They are there to get to the other side of them. So just get to the other side of them. Don't wait until they get to a point where you're like, oh, I have to deal with it now and carry it. That's just weight. It's weight that holds you back. Okay, now go. What? Did we want to get into minimalism and, and the challenges we've been well, seeing Well, what about recently? our inner age contest? Okay, inner, let's do that first. Yeah, so we had an inner age contest where we, had, we also got our inner ages with this blood work. And 
Okay, I'll just read off what people had predicted. (laughs) So exciting. Okay, the first thing that everyone predicted was that I was going to be, my inner age was going to be younger than BJ's. Hands down, all you people thought I was going to be older. (laughs) There was no, there was no strain from that. There was no strain from that. Everybody said BJ is going to be the oldest person. And I want to know why, why? Yeah, why? I mean, I don't know. I am the superior human. No, (laughs) maybe. (laughs) Anyway, here are the guesses. Okay. From Amy, we got Jess 27, Beej 29. Oh, let's get our regular ages. I'm 45, BJ's 44. Okay. Nancy, Rosie's mom. She's the best. Rosie is a Bernese mountain dog that we love. Okay. Jess 17, BJ 19. Thank you, Nancy. That is 19. very, very yes. complimentary. Very, very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Pam guessed I was 37, BJ 39. Alicia guessed I was 29. BJ, I love this answer. BJ was 32.4. <laughs> uh, Christine guessed that I was 32. BJ was 34. And then Valerie, before she submitted her guesses, she had the best question we ever received, which was, Are we talking about physical age or soul age? Mm. (laughs) Which is so appropriate. (laughs) She guessed that I was going to be 28 and BJ was going to be 30. Okay. So my inner age was 31. And Alicia guessed that I would be 29. And in fact, what came up was my optimized inner age is 29.9. And then an inside tracker, it gives you all these different ways that you can kind of like reach your optimized inner age. So that was mine. I'm 31. So she is the winner. And we're going to get in touch with you, Alicia, so that we can send you an awesome gift from one of our sponsors. Are we going to send a Life Straw bottle? Yeah. Oh my God. These things are the best. They are the best. You can fill up your water bottle in the middle of nowhere with the most disgusting water. Or if you're hiking, you can fill it up in a mountain stream. And you will have clean water on the other end of your water bottle. It is so awesome. I think they retail at like 50 or 60 bucks. So Alicia's going to get one of those. And then Bijoie, your inner age. 49. 49. Can you believe that? You are my daddy. I am actually (laughs) five years older than I look and feel. So how did that feel when you got that? It was quite... Were you bummed? I was pretty bummed, yeah. It was a little bit of a blow because I really... Because you consider yourself, or at least I considered so myself weird. to be healthy and fit and and have a healthy lifestyle and low stress and uh, happy. And it doesn't matter with all those things. The way that they calculate it is based on a few things. So you can go into it uh, on their website. They have a scientist that came up with these these factors and... So mine came up at 40, I'm 44 and it came up at 49.3. So this means that I'm 4.9 years older than my chronological age indicates. So if I continue to improve my inner age, I can potentially lower my optimal inner age to 28.6. Oh my God, your optimal inner age is lower than mine. Yeah. Interesting. So. We're going to do that. We're going to do your inner age. We're going to get that down and we're going to get your iron up. So here's, here's what's happening. You look at the, they give you the foods that I need to focus on to, to bring me down. And for the most part, I'm eating all these foods and have been for the past few years. So what does that mean? Think about, think about it from the other way now. Like if I didn't exercise, if I weren't eating these healthy foods that they recommend and I haven't been doing this for years, how much higher would my age actually be than it is now? Because it does have a little bit to do with genetics. Yeah. And I think we should speak to that. First, I want to say that Pam won. So she will also be getting a totally awesome Lifestar bottle so she can teach all our yoga classes with it. She's going to love that. So we'll get in touch with you, Pam, and get that over to you. Genetics, and I was talking to uh, my meditation teacher about these inner age things, and he kind of laughs because he's like, oh my God, it's the physical. It's the physical, Jessica. Like, what are you doing spending so much time in the physical? And it's so true. Like, you know, our souls kind of laugh at that because really the vehicles that we're wearing in this world have so much to do with the karma that we're here to work out, right? So um, meditation is a gr- is 
not only a great way, it's really the, the primary way, the most optimal way to purify your physical body. Because anything that's showing up in your body is negative, dense energy. So this could just be old stuff that you carried into Absolutely. the world with you. Yeah, I can't remember exactly or pinpoint when it happened, but I really became vested in my health and the foods that I ate and the physical activity and uh, the low stress and the meditation. All of this is how I have transformed myself and it, it deviates from what... You're familiar with. What I'm familiar like, with growing up. Yeah, like the, the family pattern. And right. I think that that there was a little bit of an energy there, a genetic energy there to kind of keep you a little bit more sedentary and maybe not eating as healthy, uh, you know, as healthy. When, when I say that, I mean like the standard American diet, a lot of meat heavy, um, not as many, not, you know, plant heavy. And for some reason that strength in you came out earlier, but I've seen it in your other family members and it's absolutely amazing. So I guess what you were saying is, you can have two people that live in the same home that are both training for endurance events that are eating the same exact food and then the genetic makeup, their blood, their physiology can be different. And that it's so important to find the nutrition that works well for you. And so when, when athletes come to us and we've had athletes come to us and say, I'm going to eat my meat. Great. Eat your meat. Eat your meat as much as you want to eat your meat. The only thing we're going to ask is when you eat that meat, just be in touch with the fact of, is this the best, best, best meal plan for me? Did, does this fill me up? Does this make me feel good? And if it does, keep and going. And if you can answer yes to that, yeah. keep going with it. And then we just ask them to just add in more vegetables. Yeah. Just keep eating what you're eating and just add in a few more greens. But what we found is that the plants <laughs> win. They just they win. To, they start to crowd out everything else. And this is what we've, we're finding this real life examples, like real people making changes that amazing. they didn't think was possible. They weren't looking for it. They actually had resistance to it. But when they, when they start to investigate it and realize, maybe I'll just try this because the will of an athlete is so strong, they're willing to go for it. And sometimes that trickles into your, your nutritional life. If it's not your focus, sometimes you get curious. And you're like, well, maybe I will just add this in there. And sometimes that's the only thing that needs to happen to make the change. I think that's good on the blood work. If you guys have any other questions, let us know. If um, you are iron deficient as well, and if you're a caffeine drinker, or even if you're not a caffeine drinker, and you want to act in solidarity with BJ and Liz, like get in the, get in the yeah. tribe. Like they're here to support you and they would love your support as well. Join the decaf crew. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, if you're interested in using inside tracker, please check them out. Inside tracker.com. Uh, use our code Yogi triathlete and you'll save a little bit, uh, when you purchase your plan and let us know about your results. We'd love to, we'd love to see what, what's happening with you and and we can share that as well. Totally, because yeah. it's about progress, not perfection. Progress, not perfection, okay? You just never know what you're doing, how it's affecting you. So so remove the doubt. It's the money. It's so worth it to go in and get your blood work and not the chintzy crap that's covered by insurance, but use, use, a, use an organization that can really give you a good look inside, especially for athletes. Okay, moving on. All right, let's jump into Lauren's question. Hi, I've been listening to your podcast since March when I made the decision to re-engage myself and start training for triathlon again. Yes. I've been practicing yoga since 2012, and the first thing I did when I moved to Philadelphia last year was find a yoga studio. And I love this yogi triathlete pod that is going on in Philadelphia. We have a bunch of people who listen from Philadelphia. I love it. So there's something that resonates there. So keep it going. You Philadelphia people, keep spreading the word. If you wouldn't mind, please walk me through your pre-race routine, pre-race nutrition, morning of. Also, you said something in your last Ask the YTs about peeing in your wetsuit. I'm a total newbie in this respect. Why do you need to pee in your wetsuit? Also, what's the bathroom situation during races? I feel like bathroom needs are this big unspoken thing, but my race experience is so modest that it hasn't been a concern. 
unrelated, and I guess this is a question for Jess, I noticed that your logo on the podcast is an elephant. The only piece of art I've seen in your post is a beautiful Indian-inspired elephant piece, and your tattoo that I just got features an elephant on a lotus flower. What is the story there? Last question. For now, I'm sure I'll have more later. Are you planning to do any more training camps like the one in Lake Placid? Wishing you guys the best, and I can't wait for your cookbook. Oh, my God. She's awesome. Okay, let's start breaking it down. Okay, first question. Rate, pre-race routine, pre-race nutrition. Okay, we've and we've covered this before. So if you've heard this before, um, you're hearing it again for a reason. Right. And the, ours is the same. It's pretty much the same. Yeah, it's pretty much the same. And understand that our pre-race routine and our pre-race nutrition has been the the way that we have dialed it in is over the last well 12 years for BJ and 11 years for me. Are we in that or 13, I'm in 13. and 12? Yeah. Okay. So the last 13 years for BJ and 12 years for me racing. We have dialed it in through trial and error. Uh, So I would say our pre-race routine, if she's talking about nutrition, is depends on the length of the race. And so let's say we're talking about a bigger race. We're talking about Ironman. So essentially through Thursday of race week. Let's say race day is Sunday. Yeah, race day is Sunday. Through Thursday of race week, we eat. Our normal diet. Tons of plants. Tons as of plants. As much kale as we can get yeah, in. Yeah. Like we've really, really, like we lay it on heavy with the nutrients, like the real nutrient dense foods. And then Friday morning, even we usually will do a big tofu scramble. So getting in that last bit of vegetables. And then our loading starts at lunch. And at lunch we'll do, and, and this is just is what we found has worked for us. It's not going to work for everyone. Everyone's going to have different views. Some people like the fat adapted. This is what works for us. So we're not going to fool with it right now because we got, we got bigger fish to fry. <laughs> so like our Friday before an Ironman lunch will be tempeh that I cook in a pan with a little bit of Bragg's. It's super simple, nutritional yeast. And then I put that on pita bread with mustard. White pita bread. Yeah, white, like white pita basic bread. Basic pita bread. Nothing that we would normally recommend you eat. And then that night we do pasta. we do a gluten-free pasta yep. and we love the Rayos, R-A-O sauce, Rayo sauce. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Thrive. It's just the best. Our, our friend Valerie had turned us on to it. It's the best sauce. I love it. And then we'll do some... Some bread, and I'll fool with like a multi-grain bread or something at that point. But this is the big meal that we do. Big, big meal. It's Friday night. Friday night yeah. is the big meal. Yeah. So you might want to eat a bowl of pasta and wait like 10 minutes and see how how you're feeling. And if you can get in more, get in more. Yeah. And salt it. That's what salt we do. It, we'll maybe salt some it. bread or pita bread. Yep. And then Saturday morning, which would be the day before Ironman, we'll do as many vegan gluten-free pancakes as we can possibly put in our body. And we keep those really simple. I do put cinnamon on them because with just the pancakes and all the simple carbs that we're putting in our body and the maple syrup, it's like, okay, I just want to be good to my, my blood pressure and my, and my, um, my blood sugar. So I'll do cinnamon to help buffer that a little bit. Sometimes like at this point, I'm a little bit more loose. Like I'll throw in a banana. I'm not so like paranoid about about my nutrition anymore because I know my body so well. I'll just, I'll just, I just plow through the pancake. BJ just goes straight but up. One thing I want to mention is if you're going to do, and I, I recommend this for my athletes, to run through the three sports, get all of that in first thing Saturday morning before you have the big breakfast. Yeah, and, so, we'll, and we'll get that big breakfast in by 8.30 or 9 in the morning. Yeah, so get a quick swim in. All you need to do is just get, get a few strokes in get on the bike, make sure everything is fine, and then do a quick run, and then go hammer some pancakes. Right. And then, because then we're eating again around 10 or 11, so we start snacking. Pretzels, we usually do a gluten-free pretzel. We do fig vegan Newtons. Fig Newtons, and I'm just using Fig Newtons. We actually don't eat Fig Newtons because yeah, the- they're not vegan. I think we've been using um, Fig Bars. You got to look because they're not all vegan. A lot of them have whey in them, which is like, you don't even need that in a Fig Newton. So yeah, they're Nature's Bakery Fig Bar. They're non-GMO, they're dairy-free, non-G... Yeah, I mean, these are the things. You got to look at the ingredients. Even the Newman's, like you need to look on the back of the package. If you're concerned about having non-whey in your... your And I'm very concerned about having... 
whey in my food. I am I too. do not want whey in my food ever again. So we do fig bars and pretzels. And then for lunch, we'll eat around noon or one. We have that same lunch, tempeh, sauteed, little brags. Yeah, we're also drinking. We've already at this point had two 24-ounce bottles of scratch. That's currently what we're using is scratch. What were we just looking? We might be Oh, Gatorade. Out. Oh, yeah, Gatorade. Gatorade on course is now using non, no artificial flavors and taking out the extra sugar. Yeah. So we're all for using what's on course. So yeah. we, we might be switching back to that depending but there, on the there races. There it is. Like keep all channels open. Like totally. we've been using Scratch and it's been working well. But if something on course is going to be better. Right. And or equal and it's on the course, then it just takes a, a little bit of an element. Keep it keep, simple keep, keep as it simple. possible. Yes. If you can train with what's on course, train with what's on course. And then at two o'clock, we'll, two o'clock, we'll have, you know, more snacks, pretzels and fig bars. At four o'clock, we have another bottle, 24 ounce bottle, a couple more pretzels and fig bars. At this point, you got to like be in yoga pants because if not, you're going to be like, your fly is going to be down because you're just like so <laughs> full. And then but by six o'clock, our dinner is in. By six o'clock. And, and for dinner, it's it's just one cup of pasta. So you're, you're, you're really tapering off your food consumption. The volume of your food consumption comes Saturday night. So when you're at six o'clock, you've got that one cup of pasta in, see how you feel. You're probably going to be really full. So just let it digest for a little bit. Yeah. And then you want to go to bed a little bit hungry. And again, this is what we do for, for Iron yeah, Man. Yeah, this is what so, we found works for us. And then the morning of the race. So usually Iron Man starts around 630 so by 3.30 in the morning, meaning when 3.30 in the morning comes, we already have our breakfast in and four, and it's, and the quantities vary depending on the race that we're doing, the distance of the race that we're doing. But for Ironman, for me, for you too, BJ, we do a cup and a half of applesauce, one banana, one scoop of Garden of Life raw vanilla protein. We mix that up eat that, and drink 24 ounces of scratch. And another key is to put the applesauce in, then the protein powder, mix all of that in, and then put the banana in. Yeah, and refrigerate the applesauce because when it's Definitely warm, it's refrigerate not the as applesauce. good. So that's what we do for pre-race Wait, did you nutrition. Wait, say another bottle of scratch? Yeah. yeah, and the morning of. And you're going to, like, you'll feel so full. You'll be like, oh my God, I'm so full. But I guarantee by the time the race starts, about 15 minutes before the race, I may or may not shoot like a gel or have a little bit of a Amrita bar or something at that point. Sometimes I skip that depending on how I feel. But usually I am so ship shape by race time. When that gun goes off, my belly is good. I'm... Uh, and we'll get to the peeing in the wetsuit, but I'm peeing the heck out of my wetsuit because I have so much hydration in me. But this also goes to your point about the bathroom break. I think getting in this food so early in the morning allows you to work things out in your hotel room or your Airbnb or wherever you're staying. Like go to the bath, like it, everything comes out, Yeah, I feel. And then when you're getting to transition one, bathroom is not such no, an emergency. It's usually like just for pee. And right. And you can do that in your wetsuit. So I, that's, that's, this is the whole transgression of answering your question. Like yeah. worrying about the bathroom, it might not be an issue later on if you can consume all your breakfast within that right. three hour window before the race. And the other thing we do is we get the breakfast in and because it's three hours before the race start, we then have time to meditate. And so meditation is going to get you into that healing nervous system, which your digestive system is governed by that healing nervous system. And it's going to aid in the absorption of your nutrients and the digestion of that food. And it's going to calm you down. And then when we get to the race start, when I'm in my wetsuit and like there's thousands of people around me and there's a ton of nervous energy and competitive energy and ego energy, I do my pranayama breathing exercises to number one, keep myself grounded. And number two, stretch out and activate the muscles around my ribs and all my accessory breathing muscles so that when I hit the water, I'm already open. And actually you did a blog post on this pranayama breath. And the first time I used it was before Ironman Syracuse 70.3 uh, in 2015. And it helped tremendously. And ever since that race, I used the same breath 
in the same warm-up routine every time before the water. And it just it just calms your nerves. It opens up your breathing pattern. I can't tell you how much breathing has an effect on the chaotic energy you have at the race start of an Ironman or half Ironman or any triathlon. If you get nerves and you're worried about catching your breath, follow this breathing pattern, but also get yourself into a, a yoga practice that is focused on breathing. Those two things will absolutely help out your swim and calm you down for that. It'll bring you down. And it's not about your swim stroke and your swim fitness and and all that. Think about your races when you've struggled. Has it been about your fitness? Has it been about your performance? It's been about your breathing. Like you just can't breathe or you're, you're you're getting that chaotic breath. It's, it's your heart is pounding. Or you're in your your, your mind has taken yeah, your control. Yeah, your mind. Like someone's going to hit me. Someone's going to bump into me. And I don't want to get too far into the swim, but think about what all that would look like if you had a calm breath. Like you were already prepared, and you're walking into that water with confidence and calmness, and you just ease into the water and you get that swim done. And for for me, most of the time, I never even hit people. Like I never even run into anybody anymore. I've got this white light surrounding me. I have calm breath and I'm just swimming to my potential. Yeah. So the Le- breath work, we've got a link to that post Yeah. because we it's so important. I think people can really benefit from it. Yeah. You know, like a master, like a master. That's, that's what we want to be. We want to be masters. So Lauren, this again is, this is just an example of what we do for Iron Man. So it's modified, same kind of theme, but it's modified for half Iron Man. It's modified for marathon, half marathon, Olympic, sprint, all that stuff. Totally modified. So um, just so everyone knows, we do work with people, even if you're you've got your own plan and all of that, we do work with athletes to help to help them dial in what their pre-race routine is, what their pre-race nutrition is based on their diet and and then what to do the morning of. And then we do that through practicing it. So BJ does offer coaching on demand. It's really affordable. So something to think about. Okay. Moving on to peeing in the wetsuit. So I... So you, t- you talk about your experience and then I'll talk I about I feel like mine. I pee a lot, like in the morning of, I don't know if I've got like this anxiety of like, oh my God, I might have to pee because I cannot pee on the swim. Like I just can't pee on the swim and keep swimming. I can pee on the bike. I can pee on the run. But like for me, instead of waiting in line at the, at the portage on, I just put on my wetsuit and I'm just like peeing in it. So I know a lot of people might think that's disgusting and they wait until they get into the water. But a lot of times I can't wait and I'm just there and I'm just peeing in my wetsuit. So for me, it's like ease as far as peeing on the bike and peeing on the run. That's simply because I don't want to stop. I do not want to stop. I have been known to use a portage on maybe like three times in the last 10 or 12 years, like during a half marathon or something like that. But for the most part, I'm just (laughs) peeing on myself. I am. I don't know. It's kind of fun. It's a freedom. Uh, So it's not, it's not a requirement. I just, when, when my goal is to get to the finish line as fast as possible, the last thing I'm going to do is wait in line at a portage on when I know I can kind of just time it. I see an aid station coming with some water and I can just kind of pee a little bit just to release the pressure. And then I pour water like, you know, down my shorts or whatever. And it's all good. It's like, um, a bidet, (laughs) a mobile bidet. It's like a mobile bidet. (laughs) So it's very classy actually in some countries to do it. Uh, so what's your, so I I want to talk about Louisville because Louisville was like the longest wait. Oh my God. And the whole thing was pee. And the whole thing was Pete. Like we had to get to the to form this line because it was a it was a it actually was a single line to get into the swim start. And it we were about a quarter of a mile even away from where we actually entered the water and we were there sitting there for over an hour and a half. Uh, over at least an hour ninety and minutes. Half. In yeah. In the dark with a bunch of other people. So and there were porta johns right there, but there were lines, so the and it was a little bit chilly because they moved the race to October. So we were like Put on the wetsuit and you just, if you have to go, you just go right there. And you would, when the light finally came up and we were ready to, ready to start moving, they were calling the athletes in, you would be walking and you'd see like all this dry pavement and then you'd see like a wet spot here and a wet spot there. And then it was like more common as we got closer and closer to the docks. Like you were just walking in pee. We were just walking in pee. 
Everybody was doing it. This is why you want a really strong immune system. <laughs> really strong immune system because you're just walking in pee. But there's there's nothing wrong with it. I, I feel like it's... It just, uh, it removes the element of getting to the portage on. Like, everybody's doing it. It keeps you a little bit warmer. Sure. Why not? We'll throw that out yeah. there. But by the time you jump in, in the water, it's gone. Like, it's And it's just like, out. you're going to be so gnarly by the time you get to the finish line anyway. You're going to gator or whatever on you. You're going to have, like, spit on you. Somebody's going to spit on their bike and it's going to land on you. Like, Someone's going to pee like, on their bike and it's going to spray back. And it's going to spray on you. So <laughs> it's like... Just get the disgusting on with, okay? Just get it on with. But it is, uh, it's something you actually need to train yourself to do. Like if you're going to pee on the bike or um, Even on the pee swim. on the run. I can't pee on the swim. I can't. I can't. I, I gonna... shouldn't say I can't because anything is possible. Mm. But I literally would have to do dead man's float. Like I just can't relax those sphincters em- enough to get the pee out. I can. Yeah, you just let my fle- feet so. float a bit. So if you're behind me and you see I'm not kicking as much... <laughs> That means move to the left or right. He's peeing in your face. You're getting a golden shower. Okay. Um, what is the bathroom situation? So that's going to vary depending on the race that you're doing. Triathlon tends to have aid stations every mile. But not necessarily bathrooms. Aid stations every mile. But not necessarily yeah. bathrooms. So this is every... So I guess what you want to do is just look at the race that you're doing. They're going to have a course map and they're probably going to have the bathrooms... Uh, marked, but Major- majority of the time there are bathrooms in transition. Yeah, there's going to so be so as you transition from yep. swim to bike, there's bathrooms in there. And when you transition from, I'm just thinking if there's two different transition zones, it's specifically Santa Rosa. There was bathrooms as you left T2, so transition two, there were more bathrooms. So there are options in transition. Um, as Jess is explaining, there are aid stations every mile or so, at least on the run, and every 10 miles or so on the bike. They don't always have bathrooms, so just be conscious of the site map beforehand because they usually mark them pretty well. Yeah, and just know that you can always pee in your pants. And if that feels gross to you because you don't want to have pee on you, just know that a lot of times when you're stepping into those porta johns with bare feet, like... Before the swim or something like that, you're standing in somebody else's pee. So, you know, whatever. We're all one. We're all one. It's sa- at some point, our DNA is connected. I hope that helps. Okay. And then the elephant thing. All right. Let's go into the elephant. So years and years ago, and I can't remember what book it was, but it was one of my Indian spirituality books. It might have been the Dhammapada. It could have been the Upanishads. I'm not sure. But they talk about the elephant And how in Indian spirituality, the elephant is the symbol of endurance. The elephant is revered as the being that can carry the load that not everyone can carry, right? They're strong. They are powerful. They are also um, a symbol of community. They have community. They have families. They're loyal. They are herbivores. They're gentle. So what they, what, what they really show, which is, which really is what speaks to me is that they're super powerful and strong, but they're very, very gentle. And for me, that's something that I want to continue to grow into like my full power and then gentleness, right? So we say the warrior path, a warrior, warrior. Well, a warrior is someone who's always ready for battle, right? Like we're never scared. We're so powerful that we're ready for whatever it is that's going to come at us, but we're never a threat. So there's a gentleness about us as warriors. And so the elephant just speaks to me. I always thought that dogs were my spirit animal, but I really think that they're elephants. So the elephant has a lot, has a lot of symbolism, holds a lot of symbolism for yogi triathlete. And it was a vision that I had. I just saw an elephant for the face of yogi triathlete and pairing all of the power and the gentleness and the endurance and the community and the loyalness of the elephant made so much sense for yogi triathletes. So that's why her face is an elephant and there's just nothing stopping her. Like this yogi triathlete is, we are just the stewards. I mean, she is this unbelievable, powerful force that keeps moving forward. And BJ and I are just kind of like behind her following as warriors. And you guys are all right there with us, um, in support of this community. And it's really beautiful. And then as far as the tattoo goes, as a massage therapist for a long time, I had admired body art 
on people's bodies for a long time. I just really started to admire how beautiful artwork can be on the body. But I never knew what I wanted and I never, I thought, oh God, I'm, I'm too old. Like, uh, you know, my skin is starting to kind of hang in areas and weird stuff is happening to my physical body. And then it happened really quick. It was probably, I don't know, a month and a half ago, I looked down at my arm and I saw a vision and I saw an elephant and I saw flowers. And so I found through a recommendation of a friend of mine, I found a tattoo artist in San Diego who uses vegan ink and I just went to him and I said I had a vision and I saw an elephant and had a lot of detail and I saw some flowers and that's it. And so I said, just get into a zone and create from your heart and whatever you create is going to be beautiful. So I had no plan of what this was going to look like. And when BJ and I showed up three weeks later for the appointment, he pulled out the stencil and that was what ended up getting put on my arm. And when I look down at her, it's like she's been there forever. And there's a couple of things about this tattoo that means so much to me. And, and really as of late, I've had some intensity in my life that like she's really helped me with. Her front paw is up, like she's moving forward. She's, she's taking the next step. And that's such a big reminder for me. And also below the lotus flower are some clouds and above are some clouds. And that reminds me of the 10,000 foot view that I always need to have of everyone in this world, of people who may not seem to be quote unquote nice, but keeping that 10,000 foot view of anything in my life, intensities that are coming, challenges that I have, that there is a higher purpose. And it's only from that view that I can tap into the part of me that sees all the paths and the solutions and that has the unwavering faith and trust and strength and gentleness to take the next step forward. So that's the deal with the elephant. And then her final question, training camps. We are thinking about having a training camp here next year, right, Beach? Yeah, I want to get people out here in the spring because if you're traveling from East Coast or colder locations... <laughs> March and April out here is simply amazing. It's the perfect temperature and you can escape from the cold winter months and have some 65, 70 degree days with sunshine. A lot of cool those ocean days. breezes. Yeah. So we want to get something going out here. We're thinking late March. Yeah, March. So anybody that's looking at doing the Mendocino 50K with us, this would be awesome. We can do some trail running triathlon training, whatever it is, whatever you show up, um, you've got two of us here to, you know, I could take an ultra running group yeah, we've and got, you can take the triathlon group. Or we've got access to trails, tons of trails, flat and rolling. We've got access to great bike riding. We've got tons of options for outdoor lap swimming pools. Unbelievable. So we have plenty going on here and running, obviously we can run anywhere. So yeah, it, I think it'd be great to have people join us and just train and talk about nutrition and find out what they're curious about. And we can do it in a, a beautiful location, Carlsbad, which is in North County, uh, San Diego, San Diego, North County. And a lot of, a lot of groups out here have their camps out mm -hmm. here. So, um, I know Ben Knute, our, our Olympian podcaster that was on the show uh, this year, he um, he's out here right now doing his training right. with his coach, and uh, Luke McKenzie's out here right now doing his training. I mean, this is just this is such a great place. So let us know what you think about that. But we're thinking maybe March of next year. You guys want to come out, and we'll just have you know a real free range type of training camp and we can train hard and we will relax hard and we'll do yoga and meditation and all of those things that make up yogi triathlete and we'll put it all together to let you guys allow you to have the opportunity to leave here not only as better more high performing athletes but better more high performing humans and anyone curious to do uh iron man oceanside which is opening in july i have the date when they're going to be opening for registration oceanside is literally a uh, stone's throw <laughs> across from where we are, we go to Oceanside all the time and the race starts a couple miles from here, about five miles from our location at Carlsbad State Beach. So if you're thinking of doing Ironman Oceanside, which I hear is just an awesome race, I wasn't able to be here last year. You were here yeah. volunteering. I was back east 
getting my yoga certification. But this year, 2018, I'm planning on doing it. So it's a great opportunity for you to come out. Maybe maybe we'll time it around the race and and be able to get people to have a big uh, a big group doing that race. It's, oh, it's like awesome. we could all volunteer yeah. as part of volunteer the camp or, or race. race or just that would be, be involved in it. Yeah, it's it's a really good community event. It's an older event. It's been around for a while. So yeah, let's see what we can do. Hit us up if you guys are interested, have some ideas. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, cool. All right, moving on. We still have a couple more things to get through. All right, so next comes uh, an email from Brody. Hey, Brody, I'm so psyched you reached out, dude. It's so nice to connect with you. Brody says, I've been listening to your podcast for the past few months now, and I've decided to dabble in plant-based dieting. Brody, you've been listening to us. Dude. All we ask is for a review. Oh, yeah. Leave on a iTunes. review on yeah. iTunes, you guys. Help us build the tribe, man. <laughs> We're getting all this feedback. We love it. It's absolutely amazing. It doesn't cost you a thing. Just leave yeah. us a review on iTunes. It would really, really help. Okay. So I was wondering if I could get some advice if possible. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. We were wondering if we could get a review on iTunes, if possible. (laughs) Okay, I'm 27. I've been type 1 diabetic and have been for the past 14 to 15 years, and I'm very active as I participate in triathlons, training for an Ironman next year. Awesome. And I'm currently training for a 50K ultra trail run in September. I've tried to be conscious of the things I've eaten in the past, But I find that a lot of the time, after a semi-hard session, I will end up having low blood glucose level due to not having enough carbs in my system. I guess what I'd like to know is what plant-based foods can assist me in sustained energy, and is there any websites that are particularly informative about this? Uh, P.S. Since listening to you guys, I have begun doing small amounts of yoga, which has kept me away from the osteo. Oh, I, I love know. that. So awesome. I love it. So I reached back out to Brody and just asked him, you know, what type of medication he's on for type one. If you could give us a few examples of the workouts where he's finding himself deficient and what's his current fueling for his workouts. And then his response is he has four injections of insulin a day, the pumps, which essentially those pumps, I believe what they do is they, and let me just preface this by saying we are not doctors, we are not dietitians. okay? So it's always best to talk to somebody who is a professional, a professional trained in that area. Okay. I don't want to get any flack for this. We're just trying to help people out. Okay. So four um, injections of insulin a day. So pumps, what my understanding is those will automatically read your blood sugar levels and then, and then do essentially the injections for you via the pump. So you don't even have to think about it. So they're becoming increasingly popular in Australia which is where Brody lives, but they're quite expensive to buy and maintain. So that's why he still injects. And so I just want to say to that, Brody, like we're totally here to support you. If you want to put like a crowdfunding page together and we can help you put it out there and just see if we can help raise the money for you to get this pump, like the athlete community, we just want everybody to succeed. So I don't know, that's something to think about. Let us know how that lands with you. Because it would be ideal for you to have that. Okay, throughout the week, he generally does one to one and a half sessions. Um, so I'm thinking one to one and a half hour sessions of swim, bike, or run, which generally will be about 15 minutes warm up, cool down, uh, with rest being, with the rest being speed work or strength work. Weekends are usually made up of a brick session on Saturday, maybe a three plus hour ride with a 10K run tacked and a bit of a cool down swim. Then Sunday will be a long run getting distance into the legs like two hours plus. So here I had asked, you know, what are these semi hard sessions? So I'm assuming that this doesn't represent all of his training. Right. This may be just the sessions that he's feeling. Because if, low blood, because what would because if this does if this does represent all of his training as a coach what would you say about that? Uh, I would say there's a lot of intensity there. Like if you're doing that workout and you may have a coach and that's that's great. Like you've got a plan. You've he he has vision for you. As an outside observer, if you're doing that three hour ride with a 10k run every Saturday, I can see that definitely wearing you down. I definitely like to mix that aspect up. Like I would do that maybe once, possibly twice a month. But the 
The other thing that I see is that taking easy days, like super easy rides of an hour or super easy runs of 40 minutes, just con consistency and getting out there consistently training and not doing intensity all the time. Now I could be speaking out of turn. I don't know your training plan and I don't know if you have a coach, but you definitely want to have your body recover. And I don't know if you're taxing your body your body by putting in effort after effort and it never is able to catch up is what I'm, is what a possibility yeah. could be. And we were talking about that. Yeah. So if that is representative of just your semi hard workouts, okay, great. Then we're going to assume that there's a lot of recovery yeah. in between, you know, math pace stuff where you're just building the endurance engine, but not really taxing the body. So again, if you want to dig into this a little bit more, Brody, let us know. Beach does the coaching on demand and we could set up a call with you just to look at your training plan. If you're not currently working with a, a coach, even if you have a training plan, not working with a coach, this can be helpful to just have the objective mm -hmm. uh, insight, you know, to, to help you really dial in so that you're training, like you're training really smart. And I don't like to lean towards the pessimistic because I think that even with type one diabetes, you can do amazing things. I mean, there's professional athletes that have type one diabetes and they're excelling. You know, it's going to be nutrition is huge for you, but also, you know, like every athlete, you want to really dial in super smart physical training and the type one diabetes just kind of gives you a little extra wall to climb over. That's all. His current fueling includes something similar to toast with honey prior to the session. Then before the main set, after the warm up, so before he's going into these speed or strength works, he's having a bar, usually like a muesli type. And then he'll try and eat food after the session. Throughout the long weekend sessions, I'll have toast and then throughout the session, just constantly graze on bars and gels from a company um, pro performance. So throughout both, he'll usually have half strength mix of electrolyte fluid. So what do you think about that beach as far as like the fueling plan? So I would get more on a regimented schedule of 10, every 10 to 15 minutes taking something in, but I would also reduce the volume of what's going in. So you're, you say you take a bar in before you're right before the hard set. It's not going to have enough time to digest in your system. And it's actually going to, the blood is going to go there to work to, 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 to break down that food versus where it needs to be in your legs to be fuel, pushing you through on the bike. So I would almost say to time your, time your fuel for every 10 to 15 minutes, take in either electrolyte drink or a quarter of a bar every 30 minutes. You know, that, that's a good place to start. Every 30 minutes, take a, take a quarter to half a bar so that you're constantly fueling your body on a more evenly paced system. And before the hard sets, I would almost lay off a little bit on the food just before. If it's a longer hard session, so if you're, let's just say you're doing three by 30 minute repeats at race pace, and we're talking, let's talk about Ironman. Uh, you're on the bike and you're doing three by 30 minutes and you're, you're just at race pace, if not slightly above. Of course, you wanna practice your nutrition so that when you get to race day, you know how your body's gonna react at that intensity. However, I would actually, 15 to 20 minutes before that hard set, take in your, your, your hard food, your bar or half a bar, work through that main set with your electrolyte drink and maybe like even just a quarter of a bar like halfway through that main set and then see how you feel afterwards. Again, you don't wanna tax your, your stomach with putting in solid foods too much. And I know bike is where you want to gain your calories, but there's a smart way to do it. And if your intensity is high and you're putting in solid food, it's, it's working twice as hard in my opinion. Yeah. And so he was asking about foods that are sustaining. And I, I, from the research that I did, Brody, what I'm seeing is it's, it's not so much, I mean, maybe, maybe changing your food a little bit, but it's more of this really looking at measuring your, your, 
your blood glucose levels throughout the workout. And I don't know if you're doing that right now, but this is what I was finding. And I did find some really, really good resources for you online. I'm going to put them all in the show notes for you. And I'll, I'll speak to a few of them. I agree with BJ about what he's saying is like maybe eating more often. And then I'm looking at like, you're having the toast with honey and then you're doing like maybe a 15 minute warm up, and then you're eating again before the main set that, and I don't know how close that toast is, but that seems pretty, pretty close together. So maybe having a half a gel, something that's going to absorb. More liquid. Yeah. More liquid. And the half strength electrolyte fluid, I'm wondering like maybe you should go full strength electrolyte fluid. And again, I don't know how much you've been testing with this, but what I can tell you from the research I've done is that athletes with type one diabetes, and just for people who the difference between type one and type two is that type one, the the body, the pancreas has basically gone on permanent vacation. Like it's not, it's not producing insulin. It's an absolute insulin deficiency. So insulin is definitely a part of your life. I found a great research, this guy, uh, it's the Diabetes Daily Grind. And this guy has gone to, he talks about moving to a plant-based diet and how he has been able to cut his insulin in half just from going to the plant-based diet. So there ha- there is like some research coming out now about the benefits of a plant-based diet with type 1 diabetes. We absolutely know the benefits with type 2, but type 1 has kind of been that diabetes that maybe feels a little untouchable, but there's now some research that's showing, at least from the the, um, research that I've done and the reading that I've done, that we can have an effect on that. So the Diabetes Daily Grind is a great site. I'm going to put that in the show notes. And something that came out of that was he's got two great articles there, uh, fueling for a 24-hour swim relay, right? So I checked that out. And it's this girl, Amy McKinnon, who happens, when I did further research on her, she happens to live in Sydney, Australia. And then she also did another article on the Diabetes Daily Grind about the Boston Marathon and how she kept her blood sugar levels where they needed to be. And she was essentially testing her blood sugar levels every, looked about like every five miles. And it was everything from like 175 to 70 to 90. And then how she uh, worked with that. And, you know, she would like, shoot in a gel or, you know, take something that was really absorbable like a gel and was able to really maintain her blood sugar levels and end on top. So this girl, Amy McKinnon, I'm going to put, I'm actually going to reach out to her. I just didn't have time to do it, but I'm going to reach out to her and let her know that we talked about her on the show because she's in Sydney, Australia. She is an endurance athlete. I believe she is training for her first ultra, which you're going to be training for, or you are right now. And this could be a great connection for you. She is a plant-based nutrition coach. So because she's got, she's living as an athlete with type 1 diabetes, I think, I just feel like this could be a really helpful resource for you. So I highly recommend you check out the show notes. Uh, There's another great article, The Diabetic Friend, that I'm going to put in from thediabeticfriend.com on sports nutrition for athletes with type 1 diabetes, the interplay of diet insulin therapy and exercise. So that's another great one. And then there was an article on Runner's World that this athlete wrote. And essentially what he does is they rec- – so a general recommendation would be 25 grams of – I'm sorry, 15 to 30 grams of carbs every 30 to 60 minutes, right, for an athlete, like if we're running a marathon or triathlon or something like that. So what this guy does is he takes 25 grams of carbs every 15 minutes, and he's a type 1 diabetic. And so essentially the point of his article was like, all right, you guys, this is working, but I'm wondering, is there something I can do better or do I just leave well enough alone? So there's some great resources in that article, but when you see how much this guy's taking in and he's doing it every 15 minutes and he's finding that he's coming off of his workouts topped off. So what I gathered from the research I did for you is that it's, it's a, it's an individual journey. You know, we always want the easy answer, but the answer is it's going to be self-discovery of you reaching out to people like us and getting further resources, resources and support. Um, maybe raising that money to get you the pump. That would be super cool as a community. If we could do that for you, help you do that. And then 
you know, Robin Arzon, who's in New York City, mm -hmm. is a total badass athlete. You might want to check her out if you don't know about her already. She's a type 1 diabetic. And I believe that she's kind of, the last I read is that she is still on the hunt for that perfect physician that's going to help support her with what she does. But, you know, seeking out the physician that's going to help you or the endocrinologist that's going to help you really navigate this. So I, I hope that helps. I don't think that I've got a magic bullet for you to say like, oh, eat sweet potatoes and avocados. I think it's really you monitoring your blood glucose levels. You're going to be like a lab, you know, like a lab rat right now. And to really dial it in, especially if you're training for an Ironman, you're training for an ultra, you want to make sure that you get this dialed in for your long-term health. And of course, short-term as well, because, you know, hypoglycemia can, can, especially when created by exercise can lead to seizures, passing out and, you know, worst case scenario, death. So you really want to dial this in. I hope this was helpful, but definitely check out the show notes for all of these resources that we have for you. And then reach out to Beach if you want to talk a little bit more about your training. And, and we'll put a link in that coaching on demand. Um, we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. But we're here to support you, man. So thank you so much for, for reaching out to us. I wish I had the magic bullet, but life would be so boring if we had magic bullets, <laughs> right? Any more on that, Beach? It's just the path of self-discovery. Find out what works for you. Oh, my God. Right? Totally. We're all doing it, so you're not alone out oh there, my God. Yeah, I mean, BJ's on the Iron Quest now. Yeah. We all have our... We on all the have Iron Man Iron Quest. Opportunities. Okay, and I think we've got one more subject, our... Dear friend Arshad, owner of Amrita Bars that we love so much, Amrita Bars, that is our fueling choice. One of our fueling choices that we use for Iron Man. We love it on the bike and it's the only bar I've been able to find that I can run with. So I use that in my ultra marathon. But Arshad had heard us talking during a Facebook Live about self-sabotage. Self I was calling BJ out on some self-sabotage stuff. Which you do so well. Well, that's because finally our meditation teacher <laughs> is now riding your butt a little bit yeah, on self-sabotage. And so Arshad wanted us to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, so our meditation teacher brought to my awareness my, my self-sabotaging that I've been doing. And I didn't really... I wasn't aware of it, but after he was noticing it as an outside observer, I started to connect the dots as to why sometimes I'm, I'm struggling when I shouldn't be struggling. So there's, there's points where subconsciously I'm just like off the rail, not focused, and it's not even in my awareness that I'm going off the rail. And one example was the ride, I think I talked about it in that video, was the ride I did, and I'm trying to do longer rides. And with that, you need more nutrition, more hydration, more food. You need to map out that you'll be able to have access to all this. And I had the opportunity to stop and refuel, knowing that I had at least another 90 minutes in the mountains where I knew there wasn't anything I could get. And I'm like, oh, I should have enough. By the time I get up there and down, I should be able to refuel on the other side. But but you knew you didn't have enough. But subconscious. But yeah. So that's the point. Like on paper, on you paper, didn't have I enough. didn't have enough. But in my mind, I'm like, oh, I have like one and a half water bottles. It's. It, I didn't know it was going to be extra hot up. I guess I did. It was going to be warmer up top. As you go east in the mountains here, it gets warmer and warmer, and the sun comes out. And it was a good lesson. I got to the other side. I was. I was not bonking, but I was definitely, I was definitely uh, uh, depleted in my um, my water intake and. And you still had and, how many miles to go? And I still had 50, 45, 50 miles to get back to the coast. Yeah. At that point, so yeah, definitely self sabotage is huge. So to Arshad's question, it can be in anything. It can be in work. Like you're at your office job and you're trying to get a project done, and you know, you know that the boss is going to ask for X, Y, and Z, but yet you only provide X and Y because that's what you have time for and that's what you're doing and you're, you're basically getting the project done, but not fully. And then they come back to you because he doesn't always come back to you with that Y, the last piece. But 
the boss does come back to you and asks you for that. And now you're like, you got to go back in and you got to go do the work again and finish it. So it's being conscious of, of your thoughts. And obviously, how do you get there? We talk a lot about meditation, you know, really being in tune with a consistent meditation practice. And I stress consistent because it's very easy to get off the rails. Your, you, your mind doesn't want you to be, sit quietly, right? Your mind wants to be occupied with thoughts and, and to-do lists and going into the future of what, what impact this will have. But what it really needs is to strip away all those layers. It needs to sit quietly with itself so that it can have the room and space when it's called upon in everyday activity to make the right decision and to move towards move towards something that's going to benefit you and not self-sabotage you. And so I've been upfront with this a lot lately because it's, I'm thinking back to a lot of instances where I have self-sabotaged myself and it, it, it relates to relationships and scenarios and work scenarios, uh, a lot of training instances where I know the food that I'm putting in my body is probably not the best. And you call me out on that a lot. You're like, are you really going to have that? And then you're like, going to go for a run? That, how's that Chipotle hummus going right. to feel during your speed set it's not going to feel good at all and it never feels good and i get to the track set and i'm doing it and i have an upset stomach and i wonder why you know it's because i made the choice to have it and that is completely self-sabotage right there it is not high vibration it is not working me towards or moving me towards the big goals that i have and everything needs to align with that big goal so self-sabotage finds its way in there and you need to just be awake and ready. I know we're using that term. Like you need to be awake and ready to see it come in and then be able to address it. But I, not, but I mean, I totally agree with everything you're saying, but I want people to understand that the self-sabotage, the essence of the self-sabotage is fear. It is, it is always fear. And I heard this great analogy the other day from Abraham Hicks. So if anybody wants to go off the rails with super cool, like spirituality, dial up some Abraham Hicks on YouTube and dive into that. It's amazing. She's awesome, but a lot of people can't handle her. So I've had a lot of friends say, you listen to it and then you transcribe it to me because I don't know what she's talking about. But Abraham Hicks talks about self-sabotage. And she says, it's so much easier to hit a tree going five miles an hour than it is to hit a tree going a hundred miles an hour. So we get on this high where let's say it's business, right? Where it's like, oh my God, I've got so much momentum right now. All this great stuff is happening. Oh my God. Oh my God. And then subconsciously we've got fear in our subconscious. Oh my God. What if I succeed Oh my God, like what, what if it all, I've got all this momentum, but what if it falls away and there's this whole subconscious thing going on and then boom, boom, you don't go after that big account. You, you say, Oh, they're, they're never, they're never going to say yes to a meeting. I'm just, I'm going to focus. I I've got, I've got a sign. I'm going to go focus my my efforts somewhere else, right? Or you go for the big meeting, but you, like, you take one step further, you go for that big meeting, but the fear is still with you. And then you're just not, you're so caught up in the thoughts in your head and the pressure and the expectation of what if I get it? What if I don't get it? And then you self-sabotage yourself by not being fully present and not being fully yourself and not being fully in your power. Right. So the subconscious, the essence of it is fear, right? See, like you see this, like it's like you've, you're going a hundred miles an hour. You've got, oh my God, all this momentum. Uh, You can see it like, holy crap, this is really going to happen for me. Like I'm going to qualify for Kona. Oh my God. Oh my God. God." And then there's that fear of like, oh my God, what, what, what if it all falls away? What if it all falls away? And then subconsciously that fear attracts in something. And then next thing you know, you sprain your ankle. Next thing you know, you make that decision not to get that bottle of water. And because you don't get that extra hydration, you're not as fit as you could have been for the next day's long run. 
or you're not getting that big account that's going to put your business into, you know, from $500,000 to $3 million because you've self-sabotaged yourself out of fear. So it's, it's really looking at this idea of fear. You got to stay out of the subconscious. And I remember going into Ironman Lake Placid 2014, where I experienced that insane like downpour, thunder and lightning storm on the big descent and literally got to a point where I was like, well, I, I could like, I could die. Like I could have a massive, horrible accident right now. And I made peace with that. And I thought, cause my brakes weren't working and I was flying down this thing and I couldn't see and it was freezing cold. My feet were coming unclipped because I was shaking so bad and the lightning was coming down and I'm in the Adirondacks. I mean, it was right out of a movie. It was so magnificent and amazing. And I made peace with it and I said, okay, like if I'm going to go out, I'm, I'm okay with that. I am totally okay with that. And I just surrendered instead of getting really fearful about it. And it was funny because leading up to that race, I felt super fit and awesome and, and, um, felt really, really great. And I had a session with meditator Bob prior to that. And I remember he was like hammering me, stay out of the subconscious, whatever you do, Jessica, stay out of your subconscious, be 100% in the conscious mind that entire day, be 100% in the conscious mind. And I was 100% in the conscious mind. Like I was not in my subconscious, which is all my past experiences, all my past failures, all my crap that I carry around, all the deep seeds of, of fear and failure and all of that. I wasn't there. I wasn't in my autopilot. I was in the conscious experience. I was redirecting my mind to what was happening right now over and over and over again and out of the fear. And so... The best way to stay out of the subconscious is to continually train your mind to be in the conscious mind, to be in the experience of what's happening right now. And then understand this is what you're up against. You're up against a mind that you have installed in yourself as a being on this earth that is not designed for just pure experience. Your mind is designed to analyze and label and question and analyze and label and question and all of that. And the way that it does that and the way that it gets all its research and and knowledge is from past experience. And so you got to figure out a way to get out of that and into just full experience. And so getting out of that and into full experience is being in the present moment. So how do you get to the present moment? You take 100% of your awareness and you focus it on what is happening right now. I like to use the breath. I think the breath is the best way to get there. It's our quickest interface to the nervous system, so it's gonna calm you. The other way to get completely present is body awareness. So body and breath are always happening now. Those are the two quickest ways to get fully present. Notice what's happening. The body, I think, can be tricky because I think there's a lot there for the mind to get involved and start to label. Like, I'm cold, I'm shaking, I'm going down this thing. Bringing your 100% of your awareness, it's very simple math, 100% of your awareness on your breath, 100% of you is present. Leaves 0% for the thoughts in your head, for the fear, for anything else that's happening. It doesn't mean that those things are going to shut down. It means that you are now in charge of where your awareness is going and your awareness and your thoughts are two totally different things. Your awareness and your mind are two totally different things. You can do that anytime. You can do that when you're going in for the big pitch with your company. You can do that when you're looking at the stats of what your business is now. Let's say you're an entrepreneur and it's not looking good. Like, oh my God, these numbers are not looking good. But understand that what on paper looks like reality, as soon as you look at that and you say, this is the reality of now, guess what? That now is already in the past and we're in a new now. So you don't have to carry that vibration into the next moment. Every single thought, action, word that we speak, everything we do in a moment is the precursor to what we're manifesting. I can't say that enough. Every thought we indulge, every action we take, every word we speak is the precursor for what we're manifesting in our future, what we're manifesting. This is the vibration we're taking into the future. So if you're stuck in the, oh, well, this is the reality of now. Well, guess what? You're taking the reality of now and you're bringing it into the reality of now, into the reality of now, into the reality of now. 
When you have an opportunity every moment to shift that energetic vibration and go into what you truly desire and dream of, which is so big and powerful and amazing that if you have seeds of fear, which most of us do as humans, it's fertile ground for that fear to come up, fertile ground for self-sabotage. So you can do the present moment awareness anywhere, anytime, and then a consistent meditation practice is what is going to start to burn up those seeds that are planted so deep in the subconscious for no additional effort. There's nothing more that needs to be done other than meditation. And the first thing that I do with the people I work with, with meditation is I get them meditating seven days a week. You got to commit to sit. I don't care if it's one minute. This is what I start with like two, two minutes. They say, well, I'm already getting up at five to train. Okay. We'll get up at 4:58. Can you get up at 4:58? Well, yeah, I can. Great. Get up at 4.58, two-minute meditation. Boom. Do that every single day. Every single day. So seven days a week, commit to sit. And you will start to shift into more conscious living. And you will start to burn up those deep seeds that are planted in deep into your subconscious. And by doing that, you remove the negative energy right? That's, that is manifested in your body waiting to surface as injury. You start to purify your body as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think that pretty much encapsulates the answer to that question. (laughs) And so self-sabotage is is tricky because it's really buried in the subconscious. So a lot of times you think like, oh, well, that's the luck of the draw. It's not the luck of the draw. It's not the luck of the draw. That's the stuff that's showing up because we're spending too much time letting our subconscious come up and and take over our lives. We need to be more in the conscious. And you guys, this takes major, major bravery. Bravery, big time bravery. I I taught a yoga class this morning down the street at this uh, new yoga studio I just started teaching at. And it was a Saturday morning class, which is usually a busy class. And the teacher is a really popular teacher. She's amazing. She's actually going to be on the podcast. She's such a love. Her name's Wendy. She's got a great, great story. We can't wait to share it with you. And I knew I had big shoes to, to fill. And so e- even after teaching for so many years and you know having a strong meditation practice and understanding all of this stuff so well, I still had that swirly energy. That swirly energy of, oh my gosh, like what's going to happen? Am I going to be good enough? But I didn't indulge that. I stayed really conscious. I did a short half an hour practice by candlelight prior to going to the class. I did a half an hour meditation and then I walked out the door and I went to class and I stayed in the conscious mind. It was a smaller class and about a half an hour in, one woman who seemed very concerned about this teacher not being there rolled up her mat and walked out. And I could have spent the rest of the class saying, oh my God, I'm not a good teacher. Oh my God, I'm going to get fired. Oh, the whole studio is going to shut down. Nobody's ever going to come to my class. And I just said to myself, she's not, she, number one, I don't know where she's going. Maybe she had an appointment, right? Number two, maybe she's not my student. And number three, I love her just the same. You know, like it was just, it was just an experience. And the thing was, is that she was gone now. And so I could cut the ties with her energy and say, goodbye. Have a nice day. Thank you so much for the time that you were here. Never, ever is anything a waste. And I redirected my energy to the people who were in the class and we finished out the class together and had a really nice discussion after class. You know, so everything is the choice, but instead of staying in those old seeds of fear, which I've indulged in the past, I stayed in the conscious mind and I stayed in the belief that I was speaking the exact words that I was supposed to speak, that I was teaching the exact class I was supposed to teach that the exact people showed up and that there were no mistakes and that there was no right or wrong with that experience today. And I was truly at peace with it. Sounds like an amazing experience. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it was, but it ta- it does take, it takes bravery and it, and it takes overcoming the subconscious. So it, it really is spending more time in the conscious mind, spending more time there. I hope that helps. Let us know uh, what you guys think of the show. We had a lot to cover today. Thank you so much for uh, not rolling up your mat and leaving. (laughs) 
that's always, that's like the first test for any yoga teacher. It's like, I remember that being told to me, like, you'll know, you'll know when you are out of your ego, when the first person rolls up their mat and walks out. We, we are all here as teachers. And so the, the tribes that you are all creating by living the example, those are your students. And then they have students and they have students. And we are all here to support each other, whatever that, wherever we are on that level. So keep reaching out to us. We are so, so grateful for this beautiful tribe that has come together, you guys. We are a global tribe. We've got Australia is a big listener. Philadelphia, we love Philadelphia, California, Colorado, Belgium. Hey, Belgium, Ireland. Like, it's crazy when I look at our stats. We are so, so grateful for all of you. So keep reaching out. Please leave a review on iTunes. Sign up for the cookbook, which is coming out in August. So if you go to our webpage, yogitriathlete.com, the first slide you see, there's a, a link to sign up for our list. And we don't, we don't spam anyone. We just want to like keep everybody in the know of what's going on and just anything that's coming out of the Yogi Triathlete uh, headquarters. We want to keep you guys abreast of everything that's happening. And it's, it, this cookbook is going to be amazing, especially for athletes and families of athletes and families. I think the recipes are just quite amazing. Yeah. And it, it was a lot of, it took some bravery for me to finally do this. And Linda Lang, who um, is such a love, such a love. She was a podcast guest, um, just divinely walked into our life and wanted to help us with this cookbook. And she's a recipe creator. And so we have talks every week, her and I, about the recipes. And not only is she testing them, she's got her neighbors eating the food that she's creating out of the recipes. I will share one recipe. It's a coconut Um, everything is plant-based. It's a coconut banana bread with a cacao hazelnut frosting. And she was like made up these banana bread frosting sandwiches for the guys at the gym, like, you know, these big muscle men and they absolutely loved it. So we're getting really good feedback on the recipes. They're not that difficult. I am so tired of getting cookbooks that say they're easy and they're not easy. So I think these are easy. These are the foods that have been fueling us. So thank you so much. We know you guys are excited for it to come out. We are excited for it to come out. We're shooting for an August self-published through Amazon with a larger cookbook on its way probably next year, according to my psychic. (laughs) Who knows everything. Yes. And yes, we do have a psychic. Okay. So you need your crew. You need your pit crew. I got a psychic, got a meditation teacher. I got you guys. Thanks for sending in the questions and they're challenging. So thank you. I love that. I love being challenged. Keep them coming. Stay awake and ready. Get the heck out of that subconscious mind. You guys, when fear comes up, just say, Hey fear, what's up? You can go with us, but you're not driving the car.